Hi, welcome to this presentation on factors affecting system performance. If we were to go to a, computing sh a computer shop and buy something like a printer, we'd probably know that one of the factors that would affect the performance would be resolution. Another would be pages per minute, how fast the printer was going to be. But would you be able to go into a computer shop and buy a new laptop or buy a desktop computer and know that the, the, the sort of factors which make it a good computer the factors which make you get a good computer for your money. So this particular theory comes under computer structure, which is in the computer systems topic. And it is these four different strands. Describe the factors affecting computer system performance, including number of processors and cores, width of the data bus, cache memory and clock speed. Okay, so we have two computers here, uh, two different prices, quite drastically different. And uh, what I'm going to do is just talk through the different specifications of these computers and how we can compare the two uh, with these different factors. So they both have a 15.6 inch um, monitor. Doesn't really give us any more information about that other than this one here has a graphics card and the other one doesn't tell us anything about that so I would imagine the graphics are not as good as this Dell Inspiron. We can see that they both have Intel Core i processors okay so this is this here this is an i3 and this is an i7 so you can see again the Dell has um, one of the kind of upgraded chips um, it has an i7, so anything with an i is pretty good, but the higher it goes, the better it is. Um, the Dell also has 512 gigabytes SSD drive, so that's a solid state disk, which is a fast hard disk, whereas the Acer only has 128 uh, gigabytes of that space. Um, we've got dual core processor here. And we have a quad core processor here now. We know that dual will mean two, so we have two cores for this processor. And then the Dell, we have a quad core processor. So that has four cores. I will go on to describe what this actually means. In this Acer processor, we've got it's 2.2 um, gigahertz, um, stroke 3.4 gigahertz. This is the clock speed. And again, we will talk about what this means. If you compare that to the Dell, this is actually lower in the first number it says 1.8 gigahertz and then there's a forward slash 4.6 gigahertz and um, so again i'll talk about what these two different mean uh, two different numbers mean then we've got four megabytes of cache in the processor for the acer and then we have eight megabytes of cache for the dell this is something that most people wouldn't really pick up on uh, in terms of when they were buying a computer they might not consider this factor Okay, and both are Windows 10 64-bit. Okay, um, so again, we will come back to this. So this is quite a good exercise to do, to compare two different computers at two different prices. And after we have talked about all the different factors that, that affect performance, you can try this out on different computers. So we all know there's a lot going on inside a computer. Uh, when the processor is communicating with memory. This is the same in every computer. Uh, address bus is set up with the address of which memory location is required. The data bus is either being passed through, uh, sorry, data on the data bus is either being passed from memory to the processor or processor to memory. And then instructions are executed. Now, this needs to all be timed by something. And this is the clock speed. This For anybody who plays a musical instrument, you've maybe used a metronome before. That's like a timing instrument which just uh, allows you to stay in time at a particular rate. Now, clock speed is at a rate, uh, but it's a rate that we can't even imagine. Things like 2 gigahertz. That's like 2 billion instructions a second can be uh, carried out. So this might be loading the address bus, might be one instruction, and then the data bus moving one packet of data from a memory across to the processor might be another one. Now this is doing two billion of these things a second if it has a two gigahertz processor. When we had a look at the processor speeds, 
uh, in the example at the start of the presentation, there was uh, two different speeds for each computer. The first speed is the standard speed at uh, which the computer would run at just in normal circumstances. The second one is if it's under a lot of demand, it can go into a turbo boost. Now, it doesn't do this just uh, automatically because it's not good for the processor to always be running at this speed. Um, so that's why it would kind of trying to maintain the normal speed, but that is a, a speed or a rate that it could actually uh, go up to. You can also overclock a processor which um, allows it to run slightly faster. Again, this would kind of take on the speed probably of the turbo boost. Um, gamers might do this or anybody using their computer for demanding uh, software. Um, if you are to be doing this, then the processor would generate a lot more heat. Uh, and so your computer would have to take this into consideration and you would need to use some processor cooling equipment to keep your processor safe. A processor can contain one or more processing units. Each unit is called a core. Uh, a core would contain the ALU, the control unit and the registers. Now when we go back to the um, example that we saw at the start, one of the computers has, was a dual core, which means two cores, and one of them was a quad core, which means that this one had four cores. Doubling the number of cores will not simply double the computer's speed. Uh, CPU cores have to communicate with each other through channels uh, and this uses up some of the extra speed. But it will increase the speed of a processor if you have more cores. Again, especially if you're using it for demanding software. Okay, so cache memory is very, very, very high speed memory on the processor that holds recently used instructions. If you think about the fetch execute cycle, that is data which is being passed to and from the processor and memory. Now, although this happens extremely, extremely fast, it could actually be done faster. If you think that data may be on memory and it needs to get to the processor, obviously there's a few different steps that need to be taken in order to do that. It would be a lot faster if the data was already on the processor, okay, ready to go. That's where cache memory is. There are different levels of cache memory which are closer uh, and then, you know, in return, faster access for the processor. But this is the equivalent of, say, me having uh, a book in another classroom that I need to receive uh, and having to go on a journey every time I needed to read part of it and I came back and I uh, followed the instructions then I had to go back again and do the same again. Um, a faster way of doing that would be if I had my own book which was actually on my desk and I could just read it directly from there and process the instructions as I go. This is exactly what cache memory does. Uh, it allows the processor to check a little bit of memory on the processor before having to do the journey across to memory or RAM. In the examples again, at the start of the presentation, uh, there were two different amounts of cache memory. One of the computers had slightly more than the other. So what gets saved in cache memory? Well, it might be instructions that the CPU is likely to reuse. So it might be if it's running a program and there's a variable which it continually needs to change or receive the value from, then that would be something which is ideal to go into cache memory. It's not much point having something there which you're not going to reuse. The more cache memory there is, the more data that can be stored closer to the CPU. Uh, but it is extremely expensive, so that's why you don't have huge amounts of it stored on a processor. The data bus is the set of parallel wires that connects um, main memory and the processor together. And this allows uh, the two to transfer data between each other. By increasing the data bus from 32-bit to 64-bit, uh, the computer can transfer twice as much information at one time. Therefore, increasing the size of the data bus improves the system performance of the computer. This is the equivalent of going on a school trip on either a single coach or a double-decker bus. If you were to try and transfer all of the school, it would take more journeys on a single 
uh, decker bus rather than if you went on a double decker bus. In both examples of the laptops in the examples at the start, they were both 64 bits rather than 32 bits. If you were to go and buy a computer today, you're very much likely to for it to be a 64-bit data bus. Okay, so we can see a question here which says, look at this program created in Scratch. Why would the instruction below not benefit from the use of cache memory? Okay, so this is the instruction we're talking about just now. Set my number to zero. Let's just have a look at this code here. We've got when green flag is clicked, when the program is started, set my number to zero. Then repeat 10 times. Uh, change my number by one and then add my number to number list. That loop ends and then we show the number list. Okay, so a fairly simple program. Why would this part not benefit from the use of cache? Now, if you go back to what I was saying about cache memory, it's very, very fast access, but we can't store everything in it. It can only be things that we may reuse or the processor may reuse. Um, now, if you go up to set my number to zero, that only happens once. So there's no point in storing that instructions in cache memory because you're not going to use it again. In the second part, it says, how explain how the instruction below would benefit from the use of cache memory. This part is inside a loop. It's happening 10 times. So by having uh, this particular variable or this instruction put into cache memory, the processor doesn't need to travel all the way to uh, or send the data bus and the address bus to fetch data from memory each time it can find the instructions and the data on the processor in the fast access memory. So that's why this is benefiting. It's doing it 10 times, it can keep doing it. If this was to be happening a thousand times, it's gonna benefit from cache memory even more.